We're actually going to put on a little video just to let you guys know what's going on with Vice in case you're not familiar. So enjoy that. <laughs> Shane Smith is here. He is the co-founder and CEO of the international media company Vice. He wants Vice to be the next CNN, the next ESPN, and the next MTV digitally. You've also said you want to be the Time Warner of the street. We already are the Time Warner of the street. Vice magazine, which started in Montreal in 1994. It's become a global empire. You got Vice.com, international network of digital channels, TV production studio, a record label, an in-house creative services agency. You can describe the Vice brand. What, what is it? Vice is the voice of a generation. The world's first truly global, all digital youth media company. Every day, Vice delivers hours of original video online covering the news, culture, and entertainment that defines the world we live in. Everyone was investing platform, 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 money into platform, but no one was saying, well, what are we going to fill that pipe with? Vice is a network of channels, each geared to the passions of young people today. The Creators Project is a celebration of art and creativity. This is for the globe. <laughs> Noisy is the most exciting music channel on the web. I'm going to do me, and I'm going to be me. Motherboard documents the present and future of science and technology. Fightland brings you inside the world of combat sports. Thump is a total immersion into electronic dance music. The party goes on. An ID brings together the worlds of the runway and the street. Shane Smith! One of the reasons why Vice does so well is replace the media that doesn't do so well. This year, Vice adds three new channels to its growing family. Munchies is a food channel for the young and the young at heart. Real food, real people, real fun. Oh, so good! Vice Sports is a fresh take on the culture of sports. Storytelling that transcends the scores and the stats. The news cycle is like kindergartners playing soccer. Because the ball goes over here, everybody goes over here, the ball goes over, everybody goes over here. But there's a lot of other stuff happening in the world. So we just go and say, okay, we're going to go cover that stuff. Vice News is a first-person account of our changing world. Our reporters are on the ground, telling the stories that matter most in a language that young people understand and trust. Young people today have been marketed to since they were newborns. They've developed the most sophisticated bullshit detectors of all time. And the only way to circumvent that bullshit detector is to not bullshit. The people who shoot it have to be young. The people who cut it have to be young. The hosts have to be young. So if something is created in a boardroom, it will not work. Vice and its growing network of channels is defining the future of news and entertainment for young people everywhere. Well, there's a changing of the guard every generation in media, and we are the changing of the guard for Gen Y. So, uh, so you got Charlie Rose, Stephen Colbert, um, and now me. Yes. <laughs> We're in. I guess uh, to start out, why don't you tell me what is a Vice story? Because you have a lot of these like long, in-depth, uh, documentary-style videos that you do, but then you've got stuff like why I'm proud to be a promiscuous slut. Well, because I think that the story has to be interesting. That's it. We always say, look, if you're at work or at school or whatever the next day, you want them to say, hey, did you see that thing on Vice? Or did you read that thing in Vice magazine? Did you watch that thing on Vice TV show? So whatever it is, if it's food, if it's music, if it's entertainment, or if it's news, it should punch you in the face. It should be, this is interesting. 
Okay, but you, you've said specifically you're not a journalist. You're just a regular guy, right? So how did, as you're taking, as you're being taken more seriously as a, a journalistic venue, um, how, do you, how do you think about that? How do you, you know, how do you remain authentic but also be journalistic? Well, how, how I remain authentic is by not being a journalist. I think if you look at the failure of journalism in the modern age, then I don't want to be called a journalist. Um, if you look at Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, oh, weapons of mass destruction, Saddam Hussein is, 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 is aiding al-Qaeda. Everybody with half a brain knew you, Saddam Hussein wasn't aiding al-Qaeda. They were a secular regime. They were at odds with each other, yet were co-opted by the government. So if that's journalism, then they can have it. What we do is we go into it, we, we immerse ourselves into, into a story. We come at it from a documentary uh, filmmaking standpoint where we get into the story and we press record. Nine times out of ten, when you get to somewhere, the story is different than has been reported by everybody else. So that's what we do. We go in and we report the, the, the story that's not being told. Okay, so let's talk about that. You've, you've had reporters in places like Syria, Ukraine, Afghanistan, North Korea, uh, Iran, Iraq. Is there anywhere you haven't been um, or any place where, for whatever reason, as you're doing this planning, like it didn't work out? There's a lot. I mean, we get <clears throat> called, uh, you know, adrenaline junkies or danger journalists or stunt journalists or any name in the book. The fact of the matter is, is that we're incredibly cautious about what we do. I always say I'll never send anyone to do a story that I wouldn't do myself. Um, you know, we've had five shoots in Somalia that we've canceled. We had some, some shoots in Egypt that we canceled. Um, you know, we canceled some shoots in Ukraine recently because our, our um, uh, correspondent there was kidnapped. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we've, we've said no to a lot of shoots. Okay, well, let's talk about what happened in Ukraine. Can, yeah. can you give more information about like, what happened to your reporter there? Well, Simon Ostrovsky was on the ground uh, throughout the whole crisis. Um, uh, he's been working, I, I actually did a story with him in Siberia, North Korean slave labor camps. And, um, you know, so he, he, he was doing footage every day. I think he's done 34 dispatches. He has one uh, today. He was covering the, the, the sort of pro-Russian takeover um, of eastern Ukraine, got kidnapped by the self um, sort of proclaimed mayor, uh, along with another other, uh, Western journalist. We were lucky because we had a security team on the ground within eight hours, um, and they eventually got him out um, after three days and three nights. What we're working now to, to do is get the other journalists who don't work for Vice out because Simon is like, look, I'm, it's great that you guys got me out, but we need to try to get them out now. Okay. You've been incredibly lucky. I mean, given the places that you've been, this is probably one of the only times you've had a situation like this. Does it, does it give you pause before sending reporters into other The first thing zones? Simon said to me when he got back is, when, when can I go back? Um, I don't know if we're lucky or we're cautious and good at what we do, but, uh, you know, I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, look, Simon's a journalist, and, and he's been on the ground since the beginning of the crisis, and he wants to go back because that's what he does. Um, look, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're very cautious about what we do, and when we do get into trouble, we're, we have uh, crisis, uh, you know, systems in place where we, can, uh, where we can get our people out very quickly. Okay, so the process isn't before deciding to go somewhere. Let's think of the worst place we can send someone <laughs> and no. get them on the ground. No, a lot of times the, I mean, Ukraine isn't the worst place. Ukraine's an amazing place. We've been there many times. We've done many. I've shot a big piece there on Chernobyl. Um, you know, situations have a, have, a, have a tendency to sort of ratchet up, and they can ratchet up in the Ukraine. They can ratchet up in... In Egypt, they can ratchet it up in Turkey. I mean, if you go to Istanbul, Istanbul is you know, a great city, one of the best cities in the world. It happened to ratchet up at that time. Okay. How about you personally? What is the, what's the craziest or scariest place that you've, that you've been? Well, craziest is North Korea. Um, 
only because North Korea is the craziest place on earth, so it's hard to top it. And I loved it because I'm a history buff, and you know, I, I, it's very difficult in our modern age to look back to World War II and Cold War era and say, how the hell did people do that? I mean, how the hell did, oh, we'll just kill everybody. Okay, yeah, fine, let's go. And, and, and when you go to North Korea, you see, oh, the cult of personality, that utopian sort of, you know, uh, socialist, uh, you know, or communist system. And, and it's just mind blowing. You know, you get a window onto it and say, oh my God, this is just, it's incredible that the world, the majority of the world was run that way at one point. It's, it's amazing, and speaking of, of journalism, I think that it's incredibly important because you realize that if propaganda is journalism, if journalism is taken over by the state, then we all run the risk of that happening, and that's what's terrifying. Okay, so, so that was the craziest place you went. What was the scariest place you went? Well, they're scary and they're scary. I mean, North Korea is scary because you know that if you, like, or, or Iran, you're always being watched, you're always being bugged, you can be picked up and taken, you know, into a concentration camp at any time. I don't find that particularly scary because there will be a lot of lawyers, there will be a lot of, you know, papers waving around and people yelling at each other. What's scary is when things are happening that you just happen to be there. So, you know, we were shot in Kandahar, and Kandahar is completely out of control. It already is a civil war there. There's, you know, the coalition forces and the ANA, the Afghan National Army, that own the forts, and the Taliban basically own everything else. And, you know, we were, we were going to, to interview uh, General Abdul Rizik, who's the Taliban killer, and right outside his compound, we were waiting, and a suicide bomber blew himself up as we were waiting to go in. And you're just, I mean, there is no rationality. There, like, I mean, there's just bullets and bombs and IEDs. It was 9,000 IEDs in the six months that we were working on that story. 9,000 IEDs just in, 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 in the province. And, uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You okay. can plan as much as you want, but if you walk and somebody presses the button, but uh, so when you think about that, you've been doing this for about 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. You ever wake up and just think, I'm too old for this shit? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I don't know. I think actually now I enjoy it a lot more than I ever have before because I think that when you're a younger company, you struggle and struggle and struggle and how are we going to pay the bills and how are we going to hire people and how are we going to get a bigger office and you know just managing the company is so hard <clears throat> and um, you know Spike Jones uh, said you know take money out of the equation what would you do if you didn't care about the money and and this is what I'd do if I didn't care about the money and that's why it's great to have partners like HBO because HBO says, here's money, go do what you want to do. And, 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 and you know, the, that's a lot of freedom. And it's, it's a lot more fun to do that than how the hell am I going to pay my rent? Okay. Well, we're going to show a clip from HBO. Well, I right. think, yeah, so on the news side, so to go back to your journalism okay. thing, which, by the way, you shouldn't ask me that question because I'll go on for the next <laughs> two hours about it. But um, when we first started uh, doing news, everyone told us in, in the established media and in, in legacy media, young people, it's a given, it's a given. Young people don't care about news. They especially don't care about international. American youth do not care about international news. The amount of time I heard that. And also make it short, make it snackable, don't make it too serious. And we didn't believe that. And we didn't believe that because, you know, we went on YouTube and we have the highest uh, engagement time on YouTube, the highest watch time, best subscription rate, video completion, all that, those great metrics, all on our new stuff. People were watching 28 minutes on YouTube, but all of our new stuff. So we went and we asked our audience globally what they wanted in a news network before we started a news network, and, and this is what came back. We 
We've been going around the world talking to people about the big issues that matter to them and how they want the news to cover them. Mexico City. Beirut, Tel Aviv. Tokyo, Japan. If you want to tell us what you think is important, you can do it with hashtag Vice News. This generation is so bombarded with information, it's very difficult to look back and understand what this means. The internet, the new tools on our disposal, the revolutions, the uprisings, these are all methods towards changing the way people uh, access information, gather information. Standard news channel, there's maybe like five or six stories rolling each day, and that can't be all that's going on. We should do something about it. Now, with the, with the help of technology and social media and the new means of communication, it has become easier for a person to express himself loud. I hate hearing that my generation is lazy. There are absolutely people my age around the world that feel the same way that I do. News is all about what's happening with the human kind, what's happening in the human condition. We all have the chance to interact with each other and learn about each other's lives. This is how the modern world works across the globe. So when what we found was Gen Y is absolutely consumed with news. They love news. It's one of their biggest passion points. The problem is, is they've been disenfranchised by traditional media outlets. And because of that, look, if the world was going along tickety-boo and the fourth estate was doing its job, Vice would not be purveying news. Vice wouldn't be one of the fastest growing news companies in the world. Why? Because they should be good at doing what they're doing. However, what happened in America is we started doing talk radio. We started doing, you know, on the right, just sort of, you know, hate radio, and on the left, sort of snide making fun of what the right said. And no one's actually going to the places and just telling the stories. Right. But, I mean, and those kids eat this up. But what happens when they grow up? What happens when they have a kid and they start watching Two and a Half Men? Well, this is, but this is what's happening is they are growing up. And, you know, what's happening now is they realize the check's not only in the mail, right, but that it's been delivered and they have to pay the tab. The environment, you know, economics, all of these things, now Middle East, what's happening in Russia, all of these things are sort of legacies of baby boomers that you sit there and go, okay, they're, they're done now. They're going to die and now I have to sit here and and fix these problems and nobody's speaking to me. Okay, but what about the next generation? I mean, the, the hippies, you know, gave way to the 80s and that sucked. Sure. So, so, I mean, do you have to come up with new programming for when those kids grow up? I think that if you look at it, we have really incredibly sophisticated media consumers now. They understand. They understand we have to do something environmentally or we're all fucked. And, you know, and, and that's what our programming reflects. Okay. So let's talk about traditional media. Sure. Um, you raised a bunch of money from Fox last year. Actually, tell me about Rupert Murdoch. What's it like meeting that guy? <sighs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, look, here's a guy who uh, took the second largest newspaper in Adelaide and built it into the largest uh, media conglomerate in the world. So, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's interesting to meet, you know, sort of the last of the great media barons. Um, Do you have aspirations to become the Rupert Murdoch <laughs> of your generation? Uh, yes. Um, I think I would do things differently. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I th I, Vice is a challenger brand, right? Fox is fantastic for Vice. Why? Because we can go after them. You know, CNN is for fantastic for Vice, especially now. Why? Because we can go after them. You know, I don't think that they're doing a particularly good job. I don't think they're doing a good job, uh, uh, especially for my demographic. So they, they provide a foil, you know, for, for me to go after. But if you succeed, at some point, you're not the underdog anymore. Correct. So what happens then? Then somebody comes after me. Okay. That's how it works. But I'll be dead by then, or <laughs> I'll, be, I'll have my white wig and my powder and my horse. <laughs> Whenever I view success, it's just I, I'm dressed as Mozart on an island, just <laughs> riding around.
finally given in to my lunacy. Um, look, you know, we are, we are going to be legacy media at some point. I hope young people come up and try to eat my lunch because that means that there's going to be a frothy, beautiful, contentious, you know, platform where everybody's going at each other, which I believe leads to honesty and, 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 a, and a better quality product. I think the problem that we've had is four media companies run media globally. And some say they're on the right and some say they're on the left. Look, they're all afraid of losing Ford as a client. So they're all, by definition, you know, huge companies that are, that are going to be inherently conservative. And that, again, is fantastic for us because we get to come up and eat their lunch. Okay, so you've got the website, you've got the TV show. Um, you want to show the TV show? Sure. All right, let's watch the HBO clip. I think, do you have to say it? Let's watch the clip. <laughs> We just want to make great stories. You know, we like to get into places and see things that other people don't see, things that no one has ever shown. In the last six months, you have 9,000 IEDs. That's an IED. You're in the action, you're with the people who are involved with it, you're seeing how something affects people. You're following a person into a world. And I wanted to punch you in the face. Did you see that? Can you believe that? I think we're trying to show the world as it really is. Could be my young can be. Sit on this girl. This isn't necessarily the stuff people put in their papers, it's stuff that national media covers. Uh -huh. Figure out what they're saying, because I think something might be uh, might be an issue. What you're gonna see on Vice is not gonna be sanitized. There's a lot of things that are happening out there. Somebody should be saying something about this. What are the big important questions to ask here? So this is in a favela called Rossinia, which is being pacified. Are you here with the consent of the population? Aqui é um processo e operações militares. To be able to go out into the world and see these things, it gives you incredible perspective. Hanging out the front door of the palace. Looks like they're trying to bust it down. We have a lot of stories that are going to really have people sitting up and taking notice of what's happening today globally. Apparently, there's cameras there. I think that's a camera right there. Do you guys ever feel like you're being watched? They listen to us, we can listen to them. We have a lot of hosts that aren't American who, you know, can go into a, a situation and get something out of it that an American host couldn't get. The brick kiln owners realize what's happening. He can tell them that we're coming and hide the people we're trying to rescue. If I can go somewhere and say to someone, I'm willing to spend four or five weeks with you living exactly as you live, that gets me access that a full crew or a team wouldn't be able to get. What can you shoot down with this? Helicopters, MiGs, everything. These are young documentary filmmakers who are offering the look at these countries that you wouldn't see anywhere else. That's the kind of work we do, and we think it's important to tell people's stories. What we want to do is immerse ourselves in the situation. We have to press record, and we have to watch this as it happens. Jesus! We have to be here chronicling this. Well, that uh, is going to make everybody really excited for my last question. Um, which is, <laughs> you've got the website, you've got the TV show, you've got multiple YouTube channels, you've got a record label. I mean, what's next? Like, what, what could you possibly do next? Um, I think what we're looking at now, you know, we want to be the status quo. And I think on, on what, what does that mean? We're looking at distressed media assets around the globe. We looked at magazines because we're magazine guys, um, and we started buying up magazines and turning them to web properties. We did that with ID. It went very well for us. We're looking at actually, because we're platform agnostic, picking up you know, TV networks around the world. We just did an experiment in southeastern Europe where we started with a block of programming and ended up being a, a free-to-air uh, network. Um, so you know, we're looking at being completely platform agnostic. TV, uh, online, we're doing uh, more and more with YouTube. We're going to start a big program with them in, in June. Mobile, uh, we're making a huge push into India uh, with mobile. And uh, so basically all platforms, we're going to be ramping up our game. 
Um, and I think, you know, going forward, you know, we're doing, you know, 160, 170 million eyeballs a month. You know, we want to get up to, you know, we want to get to, you know, machinima numbers, but with news. So we want to be doing a billion, two billion, three billion video views a month, but with news. And, and then, like I say, we won't be the next CNN or ESPN or, or uh, MTV. We'll be 10 times that size. And that's, okay. that's I think, what we're going to do um, in the next few years. Okay. Well, good luck trying to become Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> Getting that wig. <laughs> cue, cue sound bites here. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs>